No, I'm really excited to move on to the next part of our program, our second keynote speaker, Norman Solomon. I uh, was so really pleased when he said he would participate. And uh, when I had canceled the live peace talk, I, I called him up and I said, I know we're gonna cancel, but he's, but then later on, I found out we're gonna do a, a webinar online. So he, I was so happy that he still wanted to be with us today. Thank you, Norman. Hey, thank you. Uh, I want to read a little bit about what you've done and who you are. You've been appeared on many media outlets, just too many to name. And you've had a, years of experience in freelance writing and publications. You've been in op-eds and major newspapers. And you have a book called War Made Easy, How Presidents and Pundits Keep Spinning Us to Death. It's described as a must read by the Los Angeles Times. And the, the Times calls you a formidable thinker and activist. You're also the founder of the Institute for Public Accuracy, a consortium of policy researchers and analysts. And as David Swanson already said, that you're a co-founder of the rootsaction.org. So we welcome Norman Solomon to our Peace Talk. Thank you, Norman. Hey, thanks. thanks so much. And thanks yeah. to everybody who's making Peace Talk possible. Um, it takes so much work uh, to pull off such a strong event. And um, given that we need to improv, uh, being on the ground with Peace Talk obviously became impossible. But here we are joined around the country and really around the world. I do want to say at the beginning that over the years and decades at this point, when I've gone out and spoken about issues of war and peace and social justice and the way in which our country is dragged into, pushed into one war after another, I've gotten to speak with and at many gatherings that are convened by the organization Veterans for Peace. And I've never felt more truly gratified uh, than at those times to speak to people who know firsthand about what it's like to be part of a militaristic force that has caused so much damage around the world. And so if I was wearing a hat, I would tip it to Veterans for Peace because that's an organization that informs us of what so much of the mass media, so much of the political establishment tries to make us forget. Uh, not the abstractions of war, not the rah-rah and the cheerleading for war, the pseudo-patriotism, but realities of what war is and what it does to human beings. And I think that when we talk about truth, of course, there are a lot of different uh, aspects of what can be called truth. And often the forest and the trees sort of get confused, often intentionally by mass media, where the human truth is the most profound. And it's exactly that kind of uh, human truth that we who are activists, uh, who, uh, as we just heard, uh, we've got to be persistent. Uh, we have to be at it uh, as a marathon. This is not a sprint. And we know that over the years and over the decades. Uh, so often we return as a touchstone uh, to the, the work, the life, the words of Martin Luther King Jr. And the, the mass media, the establishment uh, will tell us that he had a dream. Uh, they will tell us uh, that he uh, wrote a letter from the Birmingham jail, which certainly is as relevant today as it was then in terms of the obstacles uh, presented to real progress by so-called moderates. But there are other statements and insights from Martin Luther King that we almost never see in the corporate media, in the canons that are promoted by uh, the establishment of this country. Words that are just as resonant, as crucial today as they 
were when they were spoken and written by Martin Luther King Jr. now more than five decades ago. And one of them is a phrase that's just a few words, the madness of militarism. This is a truth that is so real and so important and therefore so banished from the general public discourse such as it is. And part of our challenge really is to continue to return to that truth, to illuminate it, to propagate it, to confront the war system with. The madness of militarism is truly upon us. It continues to be. Uh, I'm 69 now and I've always lived in a country that has succumbed to that madness and every president has been part of it and has helped to propagate it to some significant degree, some, some worse than, than others. There's another quote I'd like to share that I ran across only fairly recently from Dr. King. And it has, I think, great implications for us who are engaged in activism. And he wrote in really his last book, as it turned out, I'm quoting here, power without love is reckless and abusive. Power without love is reckless and abusive. But he added something else. He said, love without power is sentimental and anemic. Love without power is sentimental and anemic. And people who are suffering from the cruelty of the warfare state, of the corporate capitalism that is accentuating income inequality and injustice, we're tired of being anemic. We're tired of love that gets crushed by the systems of militarism and corporate dominance. And that's very tangible for us. And part of what's so encouraging to me in the last years has been the overall upsurge of progressive activism, that we are becoming less anemic, we're developing our power. We recognize, as Dr. King said, that the usual use of power is destructive and illegitimate, but we recognize that the way to counter it is not to walk away and give up, but rather to develop authentic people power. And that's our ongoing challenge. We live in a propaganda state. We get so many messages from the mass media, which are corporate owned. I remind people that, for instance, MSNBC, which is beloved by many uh, progressives, owned by Comcast, and people want to believe perhaps that it doesn't matter who owns a network, what owns a network, but tell that to Rupert Murdoch, it certainly matters for Fox in terms of who owns it, and Comcast, a labor-busting, consumer-exploiting corporate corporation, uh, we're looking at mass media that are sending us constant messages that tell us that the United States has a prerogative to work its will on the world and that any other power, great or small, that doesn't bend the knee to and defer to the United States is somehow illegitimate, a threat, and must be countered. And so we've heard for three and a half years now, virtually four years now, about the threat of Russia. And I'm sorry to say that I, I heard quite a few people who have engaged in peace activism, social justice activism, who from my vantage point have succumbed to the propaganda message that Russia is our adversary, Russia is our enemy, and Russia is a foremost, if not the foremost, danger to American democracy. I've looked at lists that have been compiled by activists documenting hundreds of ways in which democracy 
has been suppressed, has been damaged. The rights of voters have been curtailed in this country, hundreds and hundreds of ways from the what's called caging to intimidation to purging of voter rolls, so many different methods that have been imposed to try to limit use of the franchise to prevent people's right to vote from being exercised in the United States of America. Not one of those techniques were imposed from overseas. They didn't come from Russia, they didn't come from China. They're homegrown. So I believe we need to confront and reassert that the dangers and threats and attacks on democracy in the United States are overwhelmingly, virtually unanimously homegrown. When corporate America, when the militarists of the United States attacks our prerogatives for everybody, the human right of everybody to have health care, education, housing, when the racists and the corporate aligned right wing suppress the right to vote, that's the threat to democracy in this country. We're also hearing a lot about how Russia is such a military threat. And it takes a leap of fact, not imagination, a leap into fact to look at who has the military bases overseas. The United States of America has approximately 800 military bases outside its own borders. Russia has 21 at last count. China has one at last count. And yet we're supposed to believe that it is the United States that's under threat from these other powers. I'm really looking forward to, to questions from folks. I do wanna close by mentioning that I think a huge challenge we have, and it's ongoing, it's 24-7, 365, is to adhere to a single standard of human rights, which may be less easy than possible, uh, than we think uh, practical. Or maybe it is easier than we think if we get used to it. But a single standard of human rights is not that easy. Uh, we're familiar with how, although it is a situation improving, there are a lot of folks who are, so to speak, progressive, except for Palestine, where the human rights of Palestinians are somehow subordinated. Well, that should clearly be unacceptable. I can't tell you how many people I've heard from in the last year telling me uh, what a great leader Tulsi Gabbard is, how she speaks out where other politicians don't uh, for progressive values. And yet, Tulsi Gabbard, just to take an example, uh, she's tremendously aligned with uh, a fascistic person uh, who is the leader of the uh, Indian government, Modi. Uh, how can this be? How, as a matter of fact, I was told by one person, uh, oh, don't bring that up. That's peripheral. Well, tell that to the people in India, so many Muslims and others who are being terrorized by the Modi government. Uh, this is, again, just a challenge to keep a single standard of human rights, which has everything to do with creating a world of social justice where we can have justice and therefore we can have peace. I'm just uh, so pleased that uh, we have the opportunities to continue to meld the strength of various movements, the uh, anti-war movement joining and we have to learn how to do and, and do it more effectively. Let's face it, we're not in media fashion these days. There's so many other issues uh, that are, uh, have come to the forefront, but uh, to join with anti-racist movements, uh, movements for economic justice on climate, uh, to challenge nuclear weapons, which are there and have to be uh, directly confronted as a threat uh, to the planet, uh, two trillion dollar plus program. It's uh, complete insanity to be refurbishing nuclear weapons when we should be figuring out how to take them apart. That's our 
that's our future. That's the future of humanity is to not go along with the madness of militarism, but show not only through our words, but our actions, that there's another way. Okay, Norman, thank you very much. We, I'm sure we have a lot of questions for you today. I would like to start off with one that I've written up here. Whenever we have a national election coming up for president, they always talk about a candidate having foreign policy experience. Mm -hmm. I always question what that means. And to be to have foreign policy experience, does that mean you're good at deception? I kind of think of it as that way. And uh, how do we get politicians to say that uh, foreign policy, good foreign policy, is speaking the truth? Uh, how can we convey that message? Well, um, you know, I like to say my crystal ball is permanently in the shop. I will, <laughs> however, make a prediction. Uh, the next president of the United States who's sworn in, uh, whoever that is, uh, on Inauguration Day next January, that person will be a militarist. That person will be aligned with the military-industrial surveillance complex. And so the ground has to shift under that person, the political ground. When we've seen in terms of Joe Biden, he has a horrible record on military affairs uh, and on quite a few other issues. And while in uh, swing states, I advocate for people to use the only tool available to get rid of uh, Trump, which is obviously Biden in the swing states, the reality is that uh, Biden can only uh, be induced to change his policies if he's president, if we raise hell. We raise hell in terms of insisting that the same political pressure that dragged him into, for instance, uh, saying that he wanted free college for families under $125,000, that dragged him into saying something which was considered beyond the pale just a few years ago that he supports a $15 minimum wage. That didn't happen because he suddenly became a nice guy. It happened because people organized like crazy from the grassroots in all kinds of different ways and did raise hell around those issues. I think that's how we're gonna get Medicare for all. That's how we have an opportunity to begin to turn the US government away from the militarism that has been so central to the political economy and politics of the country. Uh, so I think as usual, it's gonna be a challenge to organize uh, and to recognize that uh, if we accept any of the uh, official scripts, uh, that passivity equals death. Do you have a question? I do. Uh, hi, Norman. Uh, my name's Stacy, and I'm the kind of the moderator over here of the Q&A session. Um, so just a reminder for everybody who's listening, uh, if you want to submit your questions for the speaker, please use the Q&A menu in Zoom, and we'll hold all the questions till now, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can in the time allotted. Uh, the first question that I have is from Michael. Are you familiar with the functioning of organizations such as the National Endowment for Democracy and do they end up doing more harm than good overseas? And this follow-up question was, do you know if they are in essence a new method of regime change that may lead us to war? Yeah, I'm somewhat familiar with the National Endowment for Democracy and it's uh, sort of akin to uh, Institute for Peace. Uh, you know, I think it was, uh, my colleague at Roots Action, who we just heard a great talk from, David Swanson, who uh, reminded me that uh, there's a insurance company named Progressive, that it's easy to label something as whatever, but that doesn't assure you of much of anything. And so the National Endowment for Democracy has had little, if anything, to do with democracy. The Institute for Peace, as far as I know, has had little or nothing to do with peace. and. Uh, a lot of that function is to just use uh, a nice sounding title or name of an organization to go in and funnel money uh, into organizations that whatever their value or virtues, sometimes are simply funded because they are uh, an enemy of the official US enemy. And uh, so that's uh, 
that's a reality we need to deal with. I think you mentioned as well as uh, National Endowment. Uh, was there another group that you, you also mentioned? Uh, no, it was actually just the National Endowment for Democracy. Right, yes. Well, um, that's been a, a tool, uh, certainly in Eastern Europe and elsewhere, of, um, of it, it's a form of, of uh, warfare that's engaged in. And certainly we, we saw that historically uh, during the 1980s and other times in Central America where there was funding with benign sounding names that really undermined authentic democracy. Um, I have another question from Mamie. Norman, I like the quote from Martin Luther King about the power, about power and love and balance. I think peace activists need to show that we can empower without becoming the oppressor. I think their quote right, close quote, has been brainwashed to believe it's them or us, but we are all going to have to find peace together. How can we overcome that divide? It's such a challenge because as the uh, pundits are acknowledging the country is very uh, polarized and divided politically. And, you know, I think that has its pluses and minuses. There has always been resistance to uh, progressive social change. And one might have uh, heard pundits, and I'm sure some of them uh, did engage in uh, bemoaning the polarization of uh, in the South and elsewhere during the 1950s and 60s, during the civil rights movement, I believe sometimes uh, differences are irreconcilable. Uh, if human rights are at stake, if peace is at stake, the best we can do, I believe, is to try to engage in dialogue as much as possible to not uh, return hatred with hatred at all uh, and try to conduct ourselves as much as possible in a way that we would like the world to be. Uh, but there is, there is a struggle ongoing in this country, whether the stakes include uh, who's on the Supreme Court or how the uh, budget pie is sliced up and who gets richer and richer and who gets hungrier and sicker. And that I think is, you know, somewhat, uh, unavoidable. I think uh, we, we have a, a struggle involved and uh, part of it, one of the thought is that to the extent that we can develop and strengthen our own media outlets and means of communication, then we, so to speak, control the narrative. And if we have a strong humanistic unyielding narrative, then we have a better chance to reach people directly. And that's very important. Um, an interesting question for me just came up from Steve. In December of 2002, you escorted Sean Penn to Iraq to see for himself what the call to war was really about. Do you continue to try to educate celebrities to engage in foreign policy issues? Well, it's an effort that, that I and many others are engaged in. And uh, by way of background, People may remember that in the middle of 2002, Saddam Hussein invited uh, members of Congress to come to Iraq uh, to see if there were weapons of mass destruction. And this was, this was an opportunity for an opening. And yet, uh, with one exception, and at the Institute for Public Accuracy, we organized a delegation led by James Averas, the former senator, and Nick Rahal, a congressperson, and we did uh, go independent of the Bush administration to uh, Iraq in September 2020. And uh, long story short, uh, it seemed at least simult simultaneity uh, was involved with then Iraq uh, allowing the weapons inspectors back in. But after the vote, and this is a little digression, but background, after the vote uh, in October 2002 to approve an invasion of Iraq in Congress, the door was slammed shut. We couldn't get other members of Congress to go. So at the Institute for Public Accuracy, we reached out to celebrities and to his great credit and his great courage, Sean Penn agreed to go and we went in December of 2002. It is, however, an uphill climb. Uh, and if we go to the moment of 2020, we have, uh, and this is 
to a large extent a good thing, many celebrities in Hollywood and so forth who are willing to speak out against the Trump administration. Uh, many of them are willing to speak out for Black Lives Matter. It's more difficult to find celebrities uh, who are willing and able to speak out against the militarism that is uh, so pernicious and pervasive in the United States. And I think to the extent we can find them, uh, we need to cultivate those relationships, uh, urge them to speak out, and then show that they have our back. They have, we have their backs if they are attacked as they, as they will be. Um, another question is, we just heard uh, Mr. Basevich speak about our harder policy on Israel. How can we do that? How do we lobby, advise, debate questioners to ask the hard questions on war and peace to the candidates? Yes, it was good. I was able to hear uh, Andrew Basevich's presentation, and um, I think that it's of a piece in the Middle East. Uh, I don't believe the United States has ever been an honest broker in the Middle East. And the myth that we have to return or should return to being an honest broker is, you know, an idea of going back to what, what wasn't, you know, and more broadly, uh, the United States role in the world, uh, certainly in my lifetime, since uh, the beginning of the 1950s, it's, I just can't see how we can or should pretend that it's been some beneficent effort that sometimes has gone awry because uh, people in charge didn't realize uh, how screwed up the results would be. Uh, during the Vietnam War, I remember Carl Oglesby wrote a great book where he said, I think it was called Containment and Change. And he said, you know, we, we believe, uh, we're encouraged to believe that the rulers, uh, the, the people in the White House, that they don't realize that this war uh, is is going to be so destructive and it won't work out on their terms. And his theory, as I recall, was, no, they, they realize uh, what uh, destruction will be wrought. They, they may well realize that it may not go uh, the way that they tell us it will go. Uh, there's not going to be light at the end of the tunnel, but they have other motives, they have other goals. They have their geopolitical, economic, and military agendas. And I think that applies to the Middle East as well. Uh, I don't believe that the last presidents who have done all the Camp David and the this and the that and said, oh, we, you know, we, we want a peace process. This is, you know, the, the very phrase peace process is, is absurd because it was never a peace process. It was a process to subjugate Palestinian people. And politically, there's been progress to sort of, I think, get more to the, the gist and, and maybe the value of what I could say in response to the question, people are organizing. And as much as we have, and as far as we have to go, so many people have put in so much work to educate, to organize, to pressure uh, Congress around issues of Palestinian rights and Israeli policies. And uh, whether they're, they're Jewish groups uh, like Jewish Voice for Peace or many other organizations, people of all faiths or no faiths, this has been progress and it's, it's been way too slow, but uh, especially younger Americans, including younger Jews, the surveys make it clear uh, that uh, knee-jerk support for Israel is a thing of the past among so many people who 10, 20, 30 years ago demographically would have been much more automatically supportive of this repressive government uh, of Israel. Okay, thank you. And Norman, I have a question. Well, we seem to, our leaders and our media seems to designate countries and leaders as enemies. And, and, and I, I get so upset with that because why can't we start calling them friends? You can't, you can't make a friend if you're going to call them an enemy. I just wonder how we can stop these lies and untruths about other countries and, and leaders. And I guess we just have to keep pounding away, I guess. I don't know. But. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, maybe one important aspect is that there's this kind of Manichaean view of the world, I guess, of the word. I, I learned when there was a critique of George W. Bush when he said right after 9-11, either you're with us or against us. And while a lot of people bought that, other people said, well, no, that's you're carving the world up into good and bad. And of course, we know which we are was the, uh, the constant message. 
And as long as that's sort of the mentality, then it not only objectifies and totally makes the designated enemy evil, but it also uh, requires that we claim to others and ourselves that the U.S. government is uh, blameless and pristine. And so then it becomes just this sort of preposterous uh, propaganda shell game. Uh, I think if we acknowledge the mixtures in uh, qualities of leadership and virtues, if you will, of of all governments. As I. Stone said, all governments lie and nothing they say should be believed, by which he meant nothing should be automatically believed. Then, for instance, the characterization of Vladimir Putin um, would fall by the wayside. I mean, I have many criticisms of Putin for obvious reasons, like suppression of gay rights and so forth, and of the Chinese government and, and other governments, as well as our own. They're different, different cultures and so forth. But if you look at history, just to take an example, and I think this would be a way, um, Professor Stephen Cohen, who writes for The Nation a lot, has done this well in terms of documentation. How do we get beyond this sort of, this is the enemy, we're the good people, they're, they're the evil people. Just in the case of Russia, if you, if you read, as, as I was, you know, felt good that I could read a couple of books by Stephen Cohen, but uh, you look at the history of the last 30 years, you know, what the United States has done to Russia, the 1990s, the shock therapy that was so destructive, the, the in peacetime unprecedented plunge in life expectancy of Russia, thanks to the predatory policies of the US government, yes, under Bill Clinton, and we ravaged uh, that country. And uh, pr after uh, the first President Bush uh, promised to not move NATO one inch eastward, uh, one country after another has been brought into NATO up to the Russian border. I mean, can you imagine if the Warsaw Pact had endured and Warsaw Pact included Mexico and Canada? I mean, this is a fact that is almost never mentioned in corporate media. It's just Russia, bad, bad, bad. And um, if we get real about this, we see that there's another way to understand history and our current possibilities. And those ways include, as you mentioned, stop just insisting that we're in search of enemies and start being in search of friends. Right. Um, yeah, one question? Yeah, uh, the theme of Peace Act this year is, where is the truth? I would offer that the truth is locked up in a Belmarsh prison. Would you like to comment on that? Uh, well, first, I always love to take away the article the truth, because there's so many, but where is truth? And and tell me who's in that prison right now? Uh, he said that the, that the, I would like to offer that the truth is locked up in the Mel Marsh prison. Yeah, are, are, is that a reference to Julian Assange? Um, I'm not really sure what he's referencing. That's the actual question, but we, if you- I would assume it is maybe. Yeah, but I would assume so, if, yeah. If, if it is, um, yes, I mean, Julian Assange is a editor, he's a publisher. And when editors and publishers get locked up for what they publish, you know there's a deep, deep problem. Uh, I don't know if it's still taught in schools, but uh, when I was in elementary school, I was taught about John Peter Zenger. And the whole deal was that I think it was under the British before the US came into existence as a country. Uh, he was a publisher. He published stuff that the Crown didn't like. And it was a uh, freedom of the press. Uh, uh, profound moment in history. And we were taught, oh, well, you support the publisher, you support the editor, you don't support repressive government. And yet, of course, the US with indictments uh, and the, the British as accessories and really Sweden as accessory too, uh, somebody's locked up who shouldn't be locked up. And this is, a, this is an ongoing issue that tells us uh, just uh, what the limits are of the US media outrage uh, because, and this has happened at times, uh, for instance, you may have read in the New Yorker, um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell uh, wrote a piece uh, right after Edward Snowden was, uh, uh, went public. And Gladwell said, uh, oh, uh, I'm sort of summarizing, executive summary for you all. He said, uh, you know, Ellsberg good, Snowden bad. Daniel Ellsberg, good. 
Edward Snowden bad, which infuriated Dan Ellsberg, who you know, as you know, is a great peace activist, and because uh, Ellsberg's a great supporter of Snowden. And I guess what I'm getting to is that uh, the uh, denunciations of Julian Assange have been opportunistic mm -hmm. ones. Opportunistic because the um, New York Times is a publisher and Julian Assange is a publisher. And when we throw one in prison, uh, if the other doesn't rise to his defense, then it tells you a lot about that uh, other outlet. Um, the next question was, where can we sue the U.S. to follow the current U.N. ceasefire? Now, now since the Security Council has voted, it, it has enforced international law. Who's punished? Who's pushing for the implementation? And, and what ceasefire is this referring to? Um, there, how can, if the question was, where can we sue the U.S. to follow the current U.N. ceasefire? It doesn't give a specific ceasefire, oh, okay. unfortunately, in the well, question. Well, just more generally, I mean, I, no, no. as with climate issues, also with war issues, if people can go to court and ventilate issues uh, and concerns, you know, more power to them. I think these are political problems, ultimately. Uh, the courts, and we, I was just talking about Snowden and Assange and so forth, historically in the United States, including in recent years, the courts have stayed out of what are considered to be prerogatives of uh, the executive branch in terms of surveillance, with some exception, and also uh, prerogatives to wage war. So uh, this was even true in the case of impeachment. There were some folks that said, well, you know, go to federal court. No, there's... Uh, you can give it a shot, but it's really a responsibility of Congress. That's something called impeachment, or is it what? Article 1, Section 8, in terms of what is the power, the real power uh, of the, the president, including to, to wage war. I think these are all political battles. Okay. I've been a peace activist for about 20 years now, and you have been an activist for a lot longer, but... We've all written many things, you know, letters to, letters to the editor, you've written books. And we just just wonder why aren't our voices being considered? Uh, we, we give logical, sound logical arguments and uh, it just goes in one ear and out the other. And uh, I don't know how we're going to get people to listen to us. Uh, we have the internet, but that doesn't seem to be working as we hoped it would. So I just wondered if there's anything, any other ways, maybe hit the streets, I guess, uh, is that the only option we have? Or? Well, I think uh, discouragement is a lot of what we feel. Uh, you know, there's that bumper sticker, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention, maybe there could be another one if you're not uh, frustrated, <laughs> you're not feeling paying attention. I think of what happened in, uh, I think it was November 15th, uh, 1969, when uh, so many hundreds of thousands of people uh, demonstrated against the war on Vietnam, including filing by the White House. I, you know, I, I was among the million in uh, D.C. at that point as, as a teenager. And uh, at the time, President Nixon made a show of saying that he didn't care. I think he had one of these huge demonstrations. It was maybe October, November. Maybe November was the big one. There was the October moratorium. But in any event, uh, it was the, the line of the White House, president's watching football. He didn't care about these million people out there. And it emerged later that he was obsessed with those demonstrations. He, he was obsessed about one person who kept holding a peace sign outside of the White House. And Dan Ellsberg and others have pointed out that there was a plan at that point under very serious consideration in the planning stage to use nuclear weapons against North Vietnam. And the huge outpouring of anti-war protest during that autumn of 1969 persuaded Nixon that it would be politically just too hazardous to do that. It wouldn't be good for his own political career and future, which, of course, is what he mainly cared about. A few years ago, uh, President Obama, as I remember, was seriously considering bombing Syria and there was a huge outpouring of uh, emails and phone calls to members of Congress. And uh, that had some very positive results uh, in terms of dissuading him. The ratio was just so overwhelmingly against. So uh, we need to just keep on keeping on. 
Okay. All right. We have the International Criminal Court, which the United States is not acknowledged or is not participating in. Uh, I guess well, I wonder if there's obvious reasons why we don't want to participate in that. Is it yes. we show our guilt? Maybe I don't know. That's yeah. what I think. Well, um, justice is for others, but not for us. And some of the justice for others is, you know, thumbs are on the scale. You're reminding me of something that Senator Wayne Morse uh, said uh, during the Vietnam War, and. You know, one of the ways in which uh, media and unfortunately even some educational institutions really suppress truth is selective. As Aldous Huxley said, uh, lies are powerful, but even more powerful is silence about truth. And so we hear about a lot of uh, people in the past of the United States politically, even from the last half century or so, but Wayne Morse is almost a non-person in terms of media, in terms of political discourse. And yet he not only was one of only two members of Congress, along with Curtis Greening of Alaska to vote against the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, that of course was based on lies, but he persisted. He was incredibly determined. He actually believed in international law and he conducted himself as a Senator with, uh, with that commitment. And it's a chance for me actually to plug a film. You know, you mentioned uh, the Warm and Easy book, and I was fortunate uh, that after the book came out, it was made by the Media Education Foundation into a film which Sean Penn narrated. And the best thing about that film, I believe, is the archival footage. And so Wayne Morse is in there, and he says, uh, you know, this is wrong. Might makes right is wrong. It's wrong when the Russians do it. It's wrong when the U.S. does it. And in denouncing the war in Vietnam, he had a single standard. He said, might makes right is wrong. And so in one year and out the other, it is a, uh, again, it's a extremely frustrating, but part of the way the system tries to suppress activism is to inculcate the discouragement that what we do won't make a difference. And uh, God or goddess knows it doesn't make as much difference as we we need and we want, but it still does make a difference. And that's where the hope is. Yeah. Uh, we, it sounds like we might have time for one more question. Uh, this is, can you comment on Martin Luther King's quote on the nation continuing to spend more on military than on human needs approaching spiritual death? Are we not as a nation in a coma or are we waking up and giving peace a chance? Yeah, that's a, that also is a great question. Um, so I remember he, Dr. King said that in a speech at uh, Riverside Church, um, as it turned out, exactly one year before he was assassinated. And it was the Beyond Vietnam speech. It's as current today as it was then. And as has been said, budgets are moral documents. And in the case of the U.S. government, immoral documents. And so we look at those pie charts and when we realize the lives that are taken, the lives that suffer because of the way in which uh, budgets are appropriated, it's spiritual death, it's literal death for many people in the United States and around the world, if we consider what is it, seven, eight billion people and there's massive poverty and suffering that could be alleviated and in many cases ended if the money being dumped into the military spending, essentially one trillion with a T dollars a year in the United States, if it if it were to be largely redirected, that also, that message, that quote from Dr. King is almost indigestible in the belly of the beast of the United States because it cuts to the heart of what the economy of the United States is about. And it's our job, our responsibility, our possibility to bring up again and again uh, that hidden history of the United States and the world where people work together to articulate not what is venal and greedy and suppressive of truth, 
but eliminating some of the finest truth that can actually nurture life instead of destroy it. Okay. I just want to add that to me, it seems like the biggest lie is when our leaders stress, I want peace. Foremost, I want peace, but it turns out to be a lie, even though they didn't intend it to be a lie when they said it. But I think we need to remind them that they said that. Yes, and arguably quite often, um, and there is footage actually uh, 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 in the Warm and Easy film, there are several different presidents using that identical phrase. And in most cases, unfortunately, those presidents didn't know they were lying. They didn't want peace whatsoever. It was just sort of a, a cover story. And uh, let me just close along with thanking everybody who has made Peace Stock possible and thanking everyone who's an activist with Veterans for Peace, that uh, when we build organizations, that is the long-term uh, catalyst or one of the key catalysts for making the changes that we want. And I, I wanna mention, and you heard David Swanson earlier and David and I and others at rootsaction.org, we started with zero in terms of uh, people who were signed on. In the United States, we, we now have 1.2 million and we, we act as an action arm for progressives. So if you're not yet getting Roots Action's action alerts, uh, I'd encourage you to go to rootsaction.org, that's rootsaction.org and sign up and we'll, uh, we'll be in communication. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Norman. And Thank you. We're wanting to have many peace talks throughout the year and uh, we could carry on these conversations in the future, I hope. Great. Would you be willing to do that? I'd love to. Okay. Thanks, Norman. Take care. Thank Talk you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.